thank you very much, um, David, for very kind introductions. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, I would like to uh, begin uh, by bringing up the voice of women in conflict in Kosovo, especially the voice of diabetes. I was sleeping and I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night as I heard people screaming outside. I saw a group of mass people standing outside of our house holding knives and other weapons. I didn't know who they were and I could not recognize any of them as they were all wearing masks. They, are, they asked us to leave the house and, as, and if we refused, they would kill us. I was so scared by them. I said they were really ready to kill if we did something wrong. I saw my neighbor were also forcibly asked to leave their houses. There were hundreds of us who were forced to leave our houses. We ran from our houses without bringing anything of value. What we had with us was only what we were wearing that night. I saw from a distance they burned our house to the ground. We fled and hid in the forest. It took us three days to get to the forest. We fled in the forest for about nine days without anything to eat and drink except leaves and water that we fed from the leaves. During our escape, I lost my husband. Later I found out that my husband was killed. I hope they never come back and never attack us again. So, sorry. This is one of the voices that I heard so many times during my research in Pozo, in Central Sulawesi. So this voice represents all the voice of the women and the men and children. So just give you some idea where the Pozo is. So, Pozo is basically so located in Central Sulawesi in Indonesia, as you can see from the map. So during that time, the population is around to over 200,000. The Muslim consists of 50, 57%, Christian 42%, and others like Hindus, Buddhists 1%. As we compare today, it's not so much different, even the population is, is less than one happened before. So if we look at the post of conflict, the phrases, you know, if you read the literature, it's be, uh, it says like a five phases, it's well known five phases. But I myself define it, uh, conflict in post will be divided into six, that I will explain later. So, you know, the phase one, the initiation, they started with the young, uh, it was the, in the month of Ramadan, they, they said it was an attack on, you know, young, uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, youth fighting. So there is a Muslim, this is based on the, what is reported. Muslim retaliation, and then, um, then the phase three is Christian retaliation, and then the phase four, where the Malin Accord started. So as you can see, there are it's, uh, the damage huge. People kill also enormous. So the the phase five, where after Malino, the peace accord, the peace agreement, uh, still but violence re reduced and the spotted killings. But really, what make, this is the most important, the phase six, the silence in violence. So really the, the peace accord 
very formal and represent most of them are elite from Jakarta and also elite from the local. So it doesn't really work. So what's really work that help build peace in Poso? That the people on the ground, they choose to silence. To silence, what I call it, silencing violence. So it somehow probably is not good, but in long term that help a lot. What I mean by silencing violence, people have been muted in terms of talking about the past. They said, we have enough, we don't want to move with us, we want to move forward. So every time when we ask, they don't just, you know, they try to avoid that kind of conversation. Um, so now, we're talking about women voices and experiences, so I would like to stress into three that will touch the issue of diabetes as well. You know, as a victim of violence, as an agent of violence, and also as women as peace builders, because we always understand always kind of um, stereotype or uh, misunderstanding that, you know, like, uh, put the woman as always as victim, but in fact, based on the Poso case, women is also an active of uh, uh, agent of violent conflict. So as a uh, victim of violence, the car is around 300 to 1,000 people, the women are uh, casualties. One day, you know, I was uh, talking with the talking with the, with the police, and the police, I want to see um, uh, the killing of the woman to the video. So I thought I was ready or brave enough, but I couldn't finish to see that video because it was very, very uh, disturbing. And as a victim of violence, also women have to flee and then within the country, so as an IDP move from one place to another. Women also victim of sexual violence. What in the case case is very, um, they, they call it female coramel and female SSB, meaning that they are the, the victim of the military uh, sexual violence. So there are a number of hundreds of cases where uh, the military uh, uh, forced to have a woman uh, were asked to have sex uh, by force. And domestic violence as well. So, for example, in domestic violence as one of the uh, female IDB coordinator in the Christian IDB camp uh, explained. I hear almost like every day, a husband and wife quarreling and fighting with each other. Some of them live just only three houses away from my house. But I still can I still can hear them yelling and fighting. We become used to hearing a woman crying because she was beaten by her husband. This is our life in the camps now. And we don't know when this kind of life will be over. So the I can see in uh, around eleven, but the biggest one two. Location in Bonnet is divided into two, for Muslim IDP camps and for Christian uh, IDP camps. So this one, the one, this is a Lake Boso. It's a very beautiful, very nice, very uh, beautiful place. But this is where, uh, the other one is Lapangan Terbang in the airport, or what is called known as Lake Lakar camp. It means, uh, if, as you can see, around that, on the bank of the lake, there is a, this is where all the, the IDP's camp uh, was. It is a very in badly condition. The floor is, is, is mud, so not even, uh, there is no concrete even. So, so when it rains, it's on wet mud. Um, so the total IDP's at the time, is um, uh, around 75 to 80,000. So the women and children IDPs constitutes around 75 to 90 percent. And in latter, except in latter camp itself, around one uh, 1,600 households. So the vulnerability of female IDPs is 
she mentioned earlier, uh, of course they lost all like property and livelihood sources. They lost everything is being taken away by their party or they just lost lack of income generation. They don't have any uh, uh, any uh, any means of to earn income because they cannot go anywhere. And of course job opportunities. School drop out. School breaks because of the they have to stay in the camp and help deteriorate deterioration. No enough uh, help uh, services. Like a public basic services for it's like schools, health services, no food, clean water and sanitation. There are after that many humanitarian uh, organizations. One thing is that what funny, what I found funny but also sad, the uh, um, the food they distributed it doesn't match with the culture, the food habit. For example, there they uh, this kind of, they distributed uh, corn. But in that area, so mostly people eat rice. So they don't eat. So many, you know, like uh, canned uh, food, yes, for emergency response, yes, that's okay. But for long term, that was not appropriate. And clean water and sanitation is very bad. So social organization and structure also is destroyed. Like for example, for uh, females, uh, economic empowerment, um, there are there were uh, female cooperatives that built the uh, inter-religious and social cohesion. It's broken as well. Trauma and other profound uh, psychological distress. Loss of legal documents. This is very important. They lost their ID. They lost their uh, lands, houses, certificates, and etc. Domestic and social violence, including incest, it was uh, alarming. Uh, because the condition of the camp, it is uh, very, um, what do you call it, um, small and just, you know, it's a lot, like a barrack, yeah? A barrack with a very, very limited uh, living conditions. Yeah? So as what they are he says, how can we achieve peace we are, if we are still living in poverty? And how can we talk about peace if we still have no jobs, no food, no education, and no place to stay? So as an agent of violence, the women play two roles. Female combatants, so in the Christian uh, side, uh, it's non butterfly butterfly warriors, but on the other side, the Muslim uh, side also they said also the better. But in the Muslim side at that time, it was very difficult to find out the information. So it's kind of between uh, the reality and the rumor. And they are also doing the supporting roles, like in terms of logistical supplies. So as a messenger, sending all the propaganda and to provoke people to. Uh, to fight and also doing the moral support, they will do the praying session to before the the, the fighting. So as a peace builders, women play to role also at the formal and the, at the grassroots peace activities. But in the formal peace process, women are invisible basically. What I mean by invisible, uh, uh, they are not as very limited in terms of numbers. And also, um, it doesn't represent really, if you look at the peace accord or the peace agreement, it doesn't really represent the, the women's needs, the girls' needs, and, uh, and children's needs. So, Malino Peace Agreement, for example, for women to Christian and to Muslim, but most are, it was being criticized because the four women are not really from, uh, this coming from the elite. Uh, so, it, I will show you the, the peace agreement. It doesn't address sexual violence against women or against warriors. Against uh, doesn't uh, doesn't also uh, address the importance of uh, uh, women's participation. So this is just an example. This is what it says in the in the peace agreement. So this is called uh, tenth agreement. 
So as a grassroots activist, women play in the, uh, 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 number of roles in terms of humanitarian activities, they help in governance and have been, uh, helping the national and international NGOs in distributing food, help services, and etc. In income generating activities, we are trying to generate some income doing helping to rebuild the women's uh, cooperative. Community organizing, you know, they are playing a role, they are playing a role as IDP coordinators. Most of IDPs, in fact, uh, coordinators, in fact, uh, are women. NGOs and, uh, you know, they create kind of uh, NGO CBOs and peace forum. They also uh, doing a uh, regular community dialogue, you know, to, uh, to educate and how to, uh, to um, create peace among the, the community. And peace education. So they do a door-to-door -door, uh, sending all the messages from uh, one house to another. You know, uh, do not provoke, uh, do not get uh, provoked by uh, 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 other abusive uh, attempt. The impact of women's peace activists, uh, activism. There is a positive impact of, you know, there is a window opportunity and also the positive impact of the conflict. So women's self-esteem and confidence increase, and solidarity and hierarchy among the women increase uh, and family income and decision making because the the change of the gender division of labor because women uh, men normally uh, become the target of uh, physical uh, uh, abuse so men normally stay at home so women the one who handle all the uh, the income generating activity. So that also gives a change in terms of the decision making um, pattern. Because women now uh, empower in terms of uh, economy, so they can now decide what, what we should do and what we should buy and what, how we're going to spend the money. And women's political participation and leadership, that promotes also women's political leadership and participation because they have been engaged in peace um, activism. So the community now, they are recognized by the community. So uh, after the post-conflict, uh, they were, uh, they were uh, um, uh, uh, promoted or they, they were uh, to be a uh, member of the local uh, councils, for example, and the head of districts, for example. So the way forward, uh, I think the most important, of course, the restoration, the rehabilitation, recovery, and development. Uh, sex and gender disaggregated data is very important. As you know, uh, it has been destroyed. Everything has been destroyed. So nothing that can be do, we can, nothing can be done. You don't know who going to be uh, targeted if you don't have the data that based on sex or. Uh, based on gender. So women's economic empowerment is the first, I think, the first important action that needs to be done. Because as, as they said, as if there is no money, there is no food, then people easily being provoked and the peace would not be achieved. So women participation in the former peace process is also very, it's needed to be promoted. And at that time, because uh, the conflict in Indonesia, the UN, uh, the UN Security Council of 1325, it was just born basically only four years old. So that was not many people know, uh, know about this, uh, especially in Indonesia and worldwide. Um, so the Indonesian government uh, trying to, you know, to uh, make people aware of this. And capacity development is not only for the women, but also for all the governments involved in uh, rehabilitation, recovery, and uh, uh, development um, initiative. So public campaigns and awareness on gender women's and children's rights is very important. And because of the, especially because of the changings of the gender division of labor, that uh, uh, the community are still not, uh, that put a lot of uh, uh, increase the burden of uh, women's work uh, because now women have to do everything. So then have to uh, 
at that time, the, especially men need to be uh, to be uh, advocated, and the woman as itself how to handle better the standings of the gender division of labor. So the violence against women and violence uh, against uh, children prevention and from protection. Uh, I will give you some example of what the initiative that has been done at that time. So this is what uh, the government initiated by the women's peace uh, activists and also including the male peace activists. So they, they initiated these activities. So they created women's leadership and peace building forum for them to share uh, their uh, their concern, their need, their problem, and then how to solve the problem all together. So it's not only in Central Sulawesi, but also in other conflict area in Indonesia, in uh, Maluku and Maluku. And they also need, as a peace activist, they think they also need uh, because this is something new in Indonesia. So they don't know how to do the, you know, how to better involve in humanitarian, how to better involve in uh, uh, in bringing the peace uh, process and how to negotiate, how how to uh, to lobby, you know, how to do uh, uh, to 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 better represent uh, women's needs in the negotiation process, for example. So database on women's leadership and peace building also need to be. So that's why, so they think it is important for them to know who the key players and who are they and how we can uh, get connected. And they also drafting local law on, on violence against women and violence against children. And um, at the same time, they started uh, doing a public campaigns on uh, 1325. So this is uh, some of uh, you know uh, the pictures of the women and men active in the forum. So thank you. The Sintu Mabuso meaning that we are all brother and sister. Thank you very much. <laughs>